both. Pose questions to either or both of them. Um, I also, I don't know if I uh, mentioned when I was introducing thanks to James Madison College for the sponsorship, but also Hillel, and we have the uh, new um, Hillel Rabbi here uh, uh, as well. Um, and I also point to you before you leave, after the discussion, we have some flyers on the side of the room there. Um, if you were inspired by Pro Professor Fermilish and like to take a course with her next year, she'll be teaching a lot of these courses we have. Um, uh, Jewish Studies courses that are offered this spring across MSU. If you're still shopping for classes, we have information about our minor, if you might be interested in minoring in this and would like to learn more. And we have some flyers for our events um, uh, in the next month or so, if you'd like to um, be informed about that. So don't hesitate to pick up some material after the discussion on your way out. So I don't know if you guys want to sit uh, at the table or you can stand if you'd like or sit, um, but then, and, and um, I'll leave it uh, to you guys, uh, maybe to you, uh, uh, Kirsten, to to take take the questions. Oh, well, that's yeah. me. Yeah, yeah. Oh, or, I mean, you. I mean, you might be able to take our own. Why don't you sit together and and um, and I'll let you, Kirsten. Okay. So I have a question for Dr. Zella. Um, how do we know that these ratios that document uh, Jewish people men and more? than uh, non-Jewish people, what time period are we sure about this? Is it from the time period 1776 to 1865, or what time period? Well we, can, well, we can only base this on documents that are sur that have survived. And the manumission of slaves, of course, is, is, is something that you, you have from the beginning of the Republic to Depends. Different states had different dates, but around the 1820s, 1830s is when it becomes illegal to manumit your slaves. You can't do it anymore. And the reason this has been stated is because there have been so many uh, Jewish wills that have survived, that have been preserved, that contain within them uh, the manumission of slaves, comments about the you know, Charlie is my best friend, and things of that sort, that the, uh, the, the assertion has been made that Jews uh, in the South who were owners of slaves were concerned about releasing them after their death. Uh, it's whether or not, I mean, I mean, again, you're talking about a very small number of, of Jews in comparison to the others, but you, you have such a large number of uh, documents that have survived, there's an assumption that's been made, an accusation, a theory that uh, that there were a, a lot of Jews were interested in just releasing their slaves. The, the fourth floor from Tuskegee University, the Rosa Moral Burger Team, Washington, Lane, and Well Cluster supports that. But it supports it uh, closer to the late 17th, going all the way through. In the words, in the words of the students who attended the colored school that were created by the Rosa Wall Well and the Right. We didn't even talk about that. I'm not sure everybody knows what you're referring to, and but uh, very briefly, uh, there was a uh, the founder of Sears Roebuck, the, the big store, is a man by the name of uh, Rosenwald. He's very influenced by his rabbi, a rabbi by the name of Emil G. Hirsch. That's his rabbi in Chicago. And his rabbi is a very prominent civil rights activist. This is at the turn of the 20th century. This is in that period when we're talking about the NAACP. And so uh, Rosenwald is inspired to create schools for underprivileged uh, blacks in the South. And he creates a system of schools all by himself and funds them. They're called the Rosenwald schools. And to this day, there's still some 90-year-old uh, 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 and 80-year-olds who went to those schools and speak about the experience of attending these schools. We didn't even talk about that, but that's another example. Uh, another example I didn't even mention, there's a book out on this or a, even a PBS uh, broadcast on it is uh, uh, the, uh, the, the 
refugees from Nazi Germany, those professors, uh, journalist professors, uh, medicine, uh, uh, philosophy, you name it, not Jew Jewish studies, who were kicked out of Nazi Germany's universities. They come to the United States, those who are able to get here, they're refugees, and they can't speak English well, so they can't uh, get jobs in universities in the United States of America. So where do they go to work? They go to work in the colleges and universities that are the black schools in the South, which will take them for almost no money because they're thrilled to have these world-class scholars and don't care so much that they can't speak English well. And there's a whole book on this as well as a documentary film. It's called uh, 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 something about Jim Crow in the South. Yeah. And, and, and the PBS did a right. Uh, PBS did a broad uh, 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 documentary on it. There's a book on it. It's a very interesting topic too. And the, they're there in the '60s and the '70s during the, the whole civil rights period. I have a question about the abolition period before the Civil War. Um, I don't remember Jews were prominent in that. Was that the case that, uh, that then the abolitionists were Jews? There, there, the, the, the abolitionist movement was um, very connected to uh, religious, uh, the, the, you know, to a Christian religious denominationalism, and so Jews, the, to be an, the abolitionist movement itself was so religiously connected that Jews. You're not going to find examples of Jews in the movement per se. What you will find, though, are examples of Jews. Uh, even even a rabbi in the South, uh, one named uh, Einhorn, David Einhorn. Uh, he, even examples. Uh, of, there are a few examples of, of these Jews who speak out against slavery, but they're not prominent in the abolitionist movement because they didn't feel comfortable because of the religious uh, association. Question about the name change. Like, you're talking about people who change their names after they arrived into America, but my last name is Crump, but we don't think it was Crump because we're a Jewish family and Crump isn't a very Jewish name. So we're thinking that it's changed at Ellis Island. Do you know if, like, stuff like that happened at Ellis Island where they changed the Jewish names to more? So, so my work is basically um, uh, arguing that that didn't happen for the most part. Um, I, I won't say that. Most genealogists and most immigration historians who have looked at it don't find very much or any evidence that it, that, that name changing happened in that um, And so it doesn't mean that immigrants who who came over to America didn't just change their names, or it doesn't mean that they didn't get their names changed if they bought a steamship ticket, or a lot of times people report, like immigrants report that um, their teachers, like kids, will say, oh, you know, my teacher couldn't pronounce my name, so she called me something else. Like, that probably happened all the time. My research is looking at legal name changing, so it's looking at people who did it in court, and the vast majority of them are born in America. They're mostly American citizens, which, it, it, it's I mean, both are really interesting things, right? It's really interesting to think about immigrants like coming to America and thinking about becoming American and trying to find a name that kind of sounds right and you know get rid of a name that sounds more foreign. Um, it's harder to find evidence for that because it's not official for the most part. You can call yourself instantly if anybody's interested. You can call yourself anything you want, and legally that can be your name actually. <laughs> totally cool. Um, so when people do it in court, there are like specific reasons for them to do it. And the time period that I'm looking at, people are doing it because they want to get into colleges or they want to get jobs and they feel like they need it to be official. And so that's why they're mostly native foreign Americans and they're doing it, they're already Americans and showing the discrimination that they face. Um, so I hate when people ask me that question, like I don't mean to diss your family, like I'm sorry, I'm sure there's like other reasons why they do it. But, but it, it's worth going back and looking in the records. Um, but for the most part, there's not very much evidence. question on name changing. Um, most of the names that you brought up are more stereotypically Ashkenazi names. Mm -hmm. Do you know anything about how the Sephardi communities reacted to these sorts of things? 
So, you know, so I haven't found very many Sephardic Jewish names in, in my files. Um, I haven't found very many Sephardic Jews changing their names. And the reason I would say that is, is because there were so many fewer Sephardic Jews in America that those names didn't really become markers, right? They didn't, nobody was aware that those were Jewish names, right? And so they didn't become kind of these racial markers. Um, uh, so I think that I've heard, I've had, in public talks I've given, I've had Sephardic um, Jews who have said things like, oh, Sephardic Jews didn't change their names, they were proud of their names. And that's probably true, but they're also facing less discrimination. They're not being racially marked. One of the strongest arguments I have is that there's like this list of like 106 distinctive Jewish names that social, social scientists come up with in the 1940s. And they're all Ashkenazi names. And they're all the sort of stereotypical names that you would imagine. Um, and they come up with that list asking like 10 Jews and 10 non-Jews, what's a Jewish name, right? And because that's what sort of people think of when they think of Jewish names, that's what comes to their mind, are names like Goldfarb and Goldstein and Rosenberg and things like that. Um, so I think that is a really good question. I haven't seen a lot of them. So I'll, I'll add a little to this, and that is, uh, you know, what I, of course, nobody, you can't touch upon everything, but I know what, uh, what uh, was said here tonight. Uh, it's important to note that that other Americans, not Jews, change their names too for what we might call Americanization reasons. In other words, if you come have a, uh, a name that's difficult to pronounce, it's a Polish name or a Slavic name, we know examples of, you know, just change it to Americanize, right? Yeah, so, and, and part of my research finds, though, that Jews at this time are oh, doing yes, oh, oh, sure, sure, I'm right. sure of that, but, but that, mm -hmm. the reason I mention this is because when, in terms of the Sephardim, they, they changed their names in the early American period. Oh, so you have, for example, but but maybe not for prejudicial reasons. I, yeah, I don't like, know. Like, I don't for know example, you have, you have Pardo is a, is a Portuguese name, which becomes Brown. So if you meet a Jew who's, you know, you know, goes way back uh, it, it, with the name of Brown, it could be that they're Spanish Portuguese, right? And the name uh, Rivera becomes rivers. And, and the purpose of doing that is not because they're changing it for business reasons, which is a, a, a phenomenon of the 20th century, but because it was more American sound. You even meet Jews by the name of Smith. You know, and uh, so, so that did happen, but earlier in, in American Jewish history. I um, have in my collection a book by Harding Wolf. Yes. Okay. And he has some wonderful lists in his book. Of and Jewish he, soldiers. Yes. Yeah. And one particular chapter that comes out is called Brothers in Arms. Yes. When he lists two and three generations of arms. How much can a researcher depend on that chapter and some of the other lists to discover or identify relationships? That's a that's a fabulous book, and uh, 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 you know, I do you know how that book gets written? Why it gets written? I ordered it. Well, the reason that book gets written by this uh, very prominent Jewish lawyer at the turn of the 20th century, it's actually the 1890s. I think 95 is when it was published. 1895 is because Mark Twain, the famous author and humorist, writes an article in which he suggests that uh, Jews are much better at selling than they are at fighting. And he publishes this, and this causes a great deal of upset. And so he gets taken to task. And Wolf is so ins incensed by this that he now, he's a lawyer, and he devotes himself for three years to putting together every name that he could come up with of a Jew from the Revolutionary War up until his own day who fought in the war, who fought for America. Now that book is currently being revised. It's being revised under the funding of the Chappelle Foundation on the West Coast. And why? Because there's a belief that as amazing as he, it was that he did this, and he did a remarkable job, but now we even know more. We can identify even more names, and so he's, it's being updated. The man in charge of this is a man by the name of John Sellers. You can 
go on the internet and you'll see it's uh, it's being developed right now. Sellers used to work for the Library of Congress. I know him, and, and it's being funded by the Chappelle Foundation. It's it's a remarkable uh, phenomenon. But what this book was essentially was an answer to Mark Twain, who who was saying Jews don't like to fight, and Jews are better at selling things than they are at fighting. And so, uh, 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 Wolf puts this book out, and he said, "Here you are. You know, look at all these Jews who fought from the Revolutionary War until the present, and so forth." So, yeah, yes. Oh, it's it's remarkable. He had he had no digital aids. He had to do this without the, the you know indexing. It's it's almost unbelievable. It's quite accurate, but now they even know more. Uh, I wanted to speak, or uh, both of you uh, have insights too. You're saying that then this period of um, great cooperation between African Americans and Jews kind of had um, more tension in it after '68, and then greater cooperation again um, after that. So I wanted to get both of your insights. I know that could be a whole lecture in itself as well um, as to what you think the prime reasons for the kind of fluctuations in cooperation. <laughs> well, you know, I said already in '68. Uh, you know, is often, you know, you you have you have this incident in Crown Heights that takes place. Um, I could show you some of this, but I won't. Uh, you know, this is this is famous incident that takes place. And first of all, there's the teacher strike in New York, where I don't I don't, I don't know how I mean, maybe some of the seniors in the room remember this. This is where. Uh, many public school teachers in New York City were Jews, and they were tenured teachers for a long time in the public school system. And in the 60s, late 60s, there arises a, 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 a very important assertion of the African American to, um, to assume leadership of, of civil rights organizations. Not, the NAACP is led by white people until the 70s. And so there, it, it, this black power movement that arises says, well, we don't need the white people to be telling us how to win our own rights. We, we should be in charge of that ourselves. So one aspect of this is the idea that there needs to be more black faces in the classroom. And this will challenge the tenure of of, of Jewish teachers in the public school system in New York. This is in the in the late 60s, and this causes tremendous tension between the Jewish community in New York and the black community. That's one piece of it. Then there's this incident that happens in Crown Heights where uh, the Rebbe, you know, the Hasidic Rebbe, is driving. Yeah. No, no. It's it's around. It's in, I think it's in the 90s. You're right. Yeah. And that, that's another incident where. Uh, uh, there's, there's uh, the, the Rebbe's, uh, uh, what is it, entourage runs, runs over uh, an African American and a boy, and, and this causes tension between the two communities. Uh, then in the, the, the issue with regard to Israel, where uh, uh, the African American leadership is uh, sympathetic to the Palestinian cause, uh, identifying with uh, people of color over the European uh, Jews in Israel. That's another tension point. Uh, th th these are these are all these are all issues that begin to cause tension between the black community and the partnership between the blacks and the Jews, which had been quite prominent in the '60s. Or the number cited begins to disintegrate, and it isn't. I mean, I mean, there's 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 even more that could be said. Uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, other examples, but but these are often the cases that are cited to be the cause of that. I remember one incident was Jesse Jackson was the term. Right. Time. right. right. But, but it, it, people often focus on the 60s, uh, the late 60s, because that's 
that they're looking for that point at which, you know, this closeness, which had existed during the civil rights period up until 64 and 65, that begins to disintegrate. Now, today, there's a renewed effort on the Jewish community and in the African American community to partner, often over economic issues, you know, uh, 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 to building economic opportunities for both communities. There's a different, you know, there's, there are, there's obviously a whole strata of wealthy African Americans, and there's an interest in pooling together to benefit both communities. There are other issues too. Another topic we should talk about, I mean, you can check this all out on the internet, is, you know, the black Muslim community in Chicago uh, with the publication of the secret relationship between the blacks and the Jews, which comes out in the 80s, I believe. These books you can find on the internet. This is a whole story. Uh, yeah, Farrakhan. Well, even before it precedes Farrakhan, you can see it's, that book is still being uh, published to this day. The, the, there's two volumes. And the, the theory of the book that is that uh, you know Jews have oppressed blacks from the time of the Bible, and it's a very uh, it's a very destructive uh, and and if it, it it has infected many many communities. I myself in Cincinnati have had to try to explain that away many times. So I wonder. I have a slightly different answer that might push it you know, back again, just like my stuff is earlier, it might push it back a little bit earlier. Um, and it, um, you know, I think that in talking about application forms, right, and talking about questions about, you know, your name and your background and things like that, um, you know, I would say that those kinds of things um, affected Jews more than they affected African Americans, right? Um, African Americans were facing different kinds of discrimination um, that was not necessarily findable on those application forms, um, and that was not healed once the application forms were fixed. So Jews' civil rights efforts went a really far way in helping Jews to sort of lose a lot of these racial markers that had made it so hard for them to get jobs. But those strategies didn't necessarily help African so a lot of historians talk about Jews' experiences as white people um, and their economic um, power um, and their ability to sort of be seen as white people, which was not always the case, right, when they're having to answer these questions and on um, application forms and things. But as those markers gradually fade away, Jews are much more able to um, uh, travel through life um, unimpeded, um, and that makes it harder as they have different issues from African Americans, it, um, it, it harms the coalition, right? Jews and blacks have created this coalition when they had similar interests and when they could work together for a cause. And as their interests diverge, um, their, the coalition broke. And I think that's, I would sort of go a little bit earlier, a little bit, um, sort of focus on those kind of structural issues a little bit more. Those, those flashpoints are clearly very important yeah. in sort of public. And definitely, we, you know, one of the things I was saying is, is that uh, we find these tensions between the blacks and the Jews right from the beginning. It's not, a, you know, it's not a love fest from the beginning, and it's not a hate fest. It's constantly what what I was thinking about in your theory, which is so interesting, you made me think of, is that you know there are other examples of instances where Jews fight for their own civil rights and then win them. And then, in retrospect, cast them out as, uh, look what we have done for all people. And uh, that's a story of the Jew in America. In other words, that we say all the time that one of our great contributions to the American society is to compel the nation to live up to the highest, lofty ideals that are enshrined within the Constitution. So your, your ideas really fit into this when you think about it. That here, what you're saying is they were concerned about fighting for their own civil rights, and then they use that to advance the rights of others. There are other examples of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah that, and that's, that's really interesting. It's very, yeah. I, I, think, I think people would sort of say, right, that they're not just fighting, but they're, they're, they're being, they have this moment, right, where they sort of see connections between their own right. concerns yeah. and those other people, and they're using that. 
Although I would, I would say you may not agree with me. I, I would say though that um, that you know in the beginning they're they're after self interest. In other words, that's yeah, what yeah. I, w I want. I, <laughs> I, I want a job. I want. I want. I want to go to school. I and, you know, right. And, 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 and then after they achieve it, they. So um, I really appreciate kind of the lens you brought, which are things that I have not heard a lot of these pieces as well. Is kind of the narrative of, of this of how Jews kind of got to their place as far as the role of Torah as women. Um, but as you know, Rabbi, I always like to end on an chapter, right? I always like to end with some type of positive note um, of, of kind of where we were and where we're hoping um, to also be standing in solidarity today. Um, and one of the things that, you know, I, I was thinking of sitting here and I actually learned Dr. Zola in your classroom was about the, the rabbis who wrote that letter after they were uh, put in jail for standing up uh, for civil rights. And I wonder if, I don't know how many people might be familiar with that letter, but I wonder if that might be a kind of nechepta piece of, of something that you might be willing to share, because I, I know that some of my students and I've discussed it a little bit, but you can teach far better than I can. Well, uh, if if we're drawing towards a close, one. I don't know if we're drawing towards yeah, a close. I, so I didn't ask you to say that. Sorry, I apologize. No, no, no. Uh, I didn't know. But what I do have that I'd love to play that I brought that I don't have the actual letter from uh, Saint Augustine, but I do have, and I don't know how many of you have seen it. It's really remarkable. I don't know if you if you all know, and it does connect with what you were saying in a way. It's a nice summation. Um, you know, everybody is familiar with Dr. King's uh, very famous address that he delivered on August 28, uh, 1963, on the March on Washington. But I'm not sure everybody knows that right before Dr. King delivered uh, that very famous I Have a Dream address, uh, he invited a rabbi to deliver a, uh, a prayer. Uh, and uh, that rabbi is a rabbi named Joachim Prinz. He was at the time the president of the American Jewish Congress, which is, as you heard, one of the organizations that um, was so very involved in advancing civil rights for the Jews and then moved into civil rights in general. And uh, if you'd like, I went as sort of a, if you want, as a nechepta, I'll play that little, it's a two minute piece, but it's very touching. And, and speaks about the connection between the blacks and the Jews. And I, could I just follow up too, because I, I mean, I'm sorry, Tom, let me just, can I just follow up on that? And then, okay, cause sorry, because I just want, I didn't want to make it sound depressing. <laughs> I didn't, I, that wasn't my goal at all. I mean, it was, Sorry, I was just I was the the dip, but then there was a rise after the dip. So it was supposed to end on the yeah. greater cooperation. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I wouldn't want to make it sound like this is only about Jews' self-interest. I mean, I don't think that is at all. And I actually think that that's what actually forms powerful coalitions. Is when people have shared concerns. It's it's better than people sort of feeling sorry for people, right? It's people sharing goals and and finding things that they have in common. And, and this is something I really struggle with in doing this work because I, I don't, I'm not interested in showing these amazing civil rights lawyers to have been, you know, self-interested jokes, right, or racists or anything. And so the end of my work that I don't show both talks about the split that I think that this creates between Jews and blacks and sort of thinking about civil rights legislation, but also the fact that the most committed of these Jewish civil rights lawyers are, are just as angry as African Americans about sort of the pro forma ways that, that that these focus on application forms does not really get to the heart of discrimination. And so you can find many civil rights lawyers continuing to sort of fight for things that are more about um, sort of working out, uh, working against discrimination that you don't find in those forms. Um, so yeah, that's a great question. Sorry, go ahead, Tony. Before we close, we don't have to do it right now. I'd like to give you the opportunity to sort of point out some perspectives Well, I, I think the only thing I'll say is, uh, as, as a historian, I anticipate that 
that future historians will write about the relationship of President Obama and the Jews in America. Yeah, that, part, yeah. Right. Well, it'd be, yeah, no, but I think that, uh, you know, I think that uh, it's, it's going to be a very rich topic. Why? Because uh, the president has been brutally criticized for being unsympathetic to Israel, right? That uh, you hear again and again these charges leveled at him. And at the same time, he has more advisors, close Jewish advisors, than most uh, of any of the presidents who preceded him. Uh, he certainly, I would bet if you added it up, he probably has more Jews who helped him to get into office and to whom he's taken close. I mean, his, his, uh, his Secretary of Treasury, the man uh, who was his chief of staff for uh, you know, uh, David uh, uh, Axelrod and, uh, Axelrod and so forth. I mean, you could go on and on. I mean, the, 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 he's filled with, uh, he has, a, he has a, a lot of close personal advice. Right, Rod Emanuel, and who, who was an Israeli. Uh, you know, so uh, this is going to be, all I'll say is I'll bet it's a topic that's going to be hotly debated by historians in the years to come. What was <coughs> President Obama's, you know, a relationship with the American Jewish community? This will be a topic of historical debate. I, I, I won't say more than that, but okay. I don't know about you, Professor. Oh, I try not to say. <laughs> you know, say historians are better. Historians are better talking, yeah, historians about, are better talking about the past yeah, than the future. We always <laughs> talk about the future. I remember as long as we're going to ask you about the future. I was like, no, 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 I don't know. I'm I, you know, I really, I mean, I really don't know at all. I read a really moving um, piece that sort of urged Jews to be involved in Black Lives Matter that I thought was really stirring. I, I have not seen any reports or conversations about Jews involved, like whether you know, how many Jews are involved in Black Lives Matter, and the degree to which synagogues or Jewish groups are talking about Black Lives Matter or becoming a part of that. Um, I would say, you know, I don't want to say anymore because I, I don't know. But I, there, I, I, there, 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 there's been some articles on this that Jew, Jews, uh, uh, Rabbis for Human Rights, uh, Cherua, these organizations have all gone out and, and marched. With the Black Lives Matter, uh, you know, so there is still a there's still a, a cadre of Jews who are very active in in, in civil rights, uh, you know, initiatives like this. Uh, but but there's also a growth in the number of Jews who joined, if you will, the more conservative wing of American politics than ever before. That's a that's a phenomenon. I wanted to tell two quick stories that may interest the, the students here. Uh, one is uh, relating to to what you said when you said a minute ago that uh, you, um, you you wouldn't like to think only of what the Jews have done as being sort of to advance themselves, right? But so I, I was once uh, I was once teaching a group of teenagers, and I was uh, I was talking about uh, this very topic that you raised, and and I. And I, I, I made the comment that, you know, Jews often will act on behalf